Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, One Shot, D, 0, 9. Initiate, Part 2. Be careful, all right? Was about to say the same to you three. I fear we leave the more dangerous task here on Earth. We'll manage. All right, so I need to talk about something else. Two things, probably, but at least one thing. So any discussion I'm going to have with you involving Young Justice and your love of the Bat family. Oh, before we get to that, yes. I, I do want to mention one more villain that we haven't talked about Ooh. who is my favorite villain of the series. Oh, please. And that is Black Spider. Oh, of Black course. Spider. Why did I not bring that up myself, sir? I don't know why. So Black Spider, for, for those who don't know, has had like three different incarnations in the DC universe. And the first two are kind of boring. Like the first one is, I think, outright racist because he is a thief who is a black person and he dresses as a spider. Like that's his whole deal. Like <laughs> they put no thought into it. And also they're like, well, he's black. Let's just call it black. Right. Because that never happened in the 60s and 70s exactly like, i mean it's all like the time black black vulcan <laughs> black Volt. like yeah come on come on guys as an aside real quick did you notice that in season two black lightning yep. in, in season two his lightning is literally black that made it so much better for me <laughs> it was a simple this is the level of detail you're talking about black lightning makes like a couple like two minor appearances and one conversation with static Yet they put that much thought into it to say, let's try and move away from this racist garbage from forever ago and yeah. and figure out a simple way to just reanimate this for a character that doesn't have anything main to do with the plot. That's loving detail. Yeah, exactly. It's like, let, let, let's take on those old incarnations. And they, they do this again with Black Spider, a character who in the comics, because like after watching him on Young Justice, I looked up every appearance that he's ever <laughs> been in because I wanted more of that. And that it just it doesn't come through in the comics. And Greg Weissman is creating this series. He worked on Spectacular Spider-Man, which had the potential to be the greatest animated series that Marvel has ever done. I would still argue that it is, but I think it could have surpassed a lot of different animated series if it had been given the time that it needed. It sadly didn't get that. Yeah. But he he, he brings his voice actor for Spider-Man. Uh, Josh Keaton, I think? I believe so, yeah. Into Young Justice to play Black Spider. And who is Black Spider in Young Justice but evil Spider-Man? Yeah. And it's so delightful because he is charming and quippy in the way that Spider-Man is, but he is just an evil jerk. It's yeah. amazing. Absolutely. He is just the negative anti-Peter, and I love it. I, I think he has like three appearances, and two of them are unbelievably delightful, including one that allows them to start off with the spectacular Spider-Man opening, monologue included. <laughs> and have him go toe to toe with Green Arrow and beat Green Arrow, which is great. And then, of course, obviously lose to Artemis because she's one of the titular characters. Right. And you, you have to have him lose. He's a villain. It's just such a charming and delightful depiction of a character that had never been any good. And actually, like a full on evil Spider Man is something that even marvel has not done like in all the times spider-man has been evil or had a mistaken identity yeah. he has never been the charming quippy spider-man that we've known and here on this random dc show with a character design that i i just think is delightful that purple suit with oh, yeah. the orange eyes and black webbing he just looks so cool and he acts in a perfect way i have on my wall i, I went to during one of the c2e2s uh, that happens in Chicago. I went to Christopher Jones, who did the Young Justice comics. comics. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy, sweet guy. He's a really great guy. I commissioned a Black Spider picture from him, and my Black Spider is the classic Spider-Man half mask look. Nice with 
an evil Peter Parker face underneath. Oh. And there's a gigantic billboard in the background that says Black Spider, threat or menace. Dude, can you give us a shot of that? And we can maybe put it in the show notes or something. I, I will absolutely do that. We've already been talking to Christopher Jones about getting him on the show. And he yeah, we, we can't wait to get him on the show and talk about stuff like this. He's a great dude. It really goes to show how many wonderful creative people were involved in this. But I think my top wish for season three is just seeing more Black Spider <laughs> and having that Black Spider take over in the DC universe. <laughs> I want that Black Spider to be a main villain. Give me more pictures of Black Spider. (laughs) I don't even know what to do with J. Jonah. (laughs) J. Jonah just makes me so nervous. J. Jonah Jameson makes me nervous. Uh, (laughs) Good J. Jonah Jameson, who I guess is just Perry White, but... Oh, kind of. (laughs) Evil Perry White? J. Jonah Jameson is evil Perry White. At least low blood sugar Perry White. Something. (laughs) Something like that. I'm so glad you mentioned... I don't know why I didn't mention Black Spider. Anyway, so one of the things I do want to talk about for sure is something on the One Shot Network that I literally stumbled across because I didn't recognize the title was going to have something to do with anything, which is called Flight of the Robins. (laughs) Now, of course, I'm well aware of what that reference, but I was like, huh, people said this is pretty good. I should listen to this. Oh, wait, this is a role-playing game staged around all of the Robins? James knows about DC Comics? Because I didn't know you that well back in the day. (laughs) Then I realized, oh, I love James so much. Also, I heard you guys are Team Aquaman, which makes me very, very happy as well. Oh, yes. We we desperately, dearly love Aquaman. Outstanding. See, this is why we're friends. I'm telling you. Not outstanding, Rich. What's that? Outrageous! Outrageous! Anyway, so Flight of the Robins, for those of you who don't know, is an adventure written by James set in the system of Shadowrun, correct? Fourth edition Shadowrun? Yes. When I originally conceived the adventure, it was fourth edition Shadowrun. Yeah. And I listened to this and I mean, I consider myself a pretty skilled bat fan. And even I was blown away by the detail of the adventure that you had created. You had this adventure. It takes all of the Batgirls and all of the Robins to be played by your players at the table, picking and choosing however many players you have, I guess, and taking all of their histories and their their own personal tragedies and villains and tying them together in an incredible adventure. Can you talk about the inspiration behind that? Like, and why did you choose like the Shadowrun system? Have you run this? <laughs> have you run this more than once? Like, I. I, I Yes, I have run this several times. Uh, first of all, I just have to say thank you so much for, for the kind words about that game. Back before I was even doing one shot, what I would do for Gen Con is I would prepare games to just run for people because there was one year at Gen Con where like, my Gen Con used to be filled up by playing in convention games run by other people. And Chaosium used to do these games where you would get to play iconic characters battling Cthulhu. And they did this one for bat villains. And I got to play the Joker. And it was my first time attempting to do the Joker's voice. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bat villains fighting Cthulhu. Is that what you just yeah, said? It was their Cthulhu adventures that they would have. <laughs> and like the set of villains that like Kat played in at first and she said I had so much fun James we have to go back and do this it was like the original one was Harley Quinn and Two-Face and Poison Ivy and the Riddler and Catwoman were like on an adventure Batman was nowhere to be found and the Joker was staging a production of the Yellow King so these villains like they're like, well, we we cannot let this happen. So they, they try and stop it. And like in that same universe, they did a, a follow-up game. Uh, and I got to play the Joker in that. It was my first time ever doing the Joker's voice. And like I walked away having so much fun and feeling like, man, I would love to play with these building blocks. I had never really thought of doing iconic characters or doing DC characters in role-playing games before. So I went to the drawing board and was like, I want to do a superhero role-playing game next year. And I think New 52 had just started. Yeah. And the reboot of the New 52 closed an era of the Bat family that was very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Because Damian Wayne had just showed up. Stephanie Brown was Batgirl 
and Cassandra Kane was still around doing things. Tim Drake was Red Robin. Uh, we had Nightwing and like sometimes Batman like in the mix for for Dick Grayson. It was just and don't forget and Jason Todd. And Jason Jason yeah. Todd's out there. So like all of the Robins except for Carrie Kelly who who just couldn't be around all of these bat people were together at one time and they had really interesting relationships with each other damian wayne and steph brown who are two characters who you know you wouldn't think there would be any intersection between those two but in the bat girl ongoing they had this like awesome friendship that was between them where steph is dc's best attempt at spider-man you know she is right. balancing schoolwork with being a robin uh, or, or a bat girl in this circumstance right and damian wayne is this loose cannon robin who doesn't play by the rules and just throwing them together they made the best cop team they were the best buddy cops ever and you know you you have dick grayson who's like this sort of paternalistic robin who's trying to take over the mantle you you had tim drake at that point was really angsty because he was the only one that believed bruce was still out there and he sort of drew like had a real wedge divided uh, not just because damien replaced him but because nobody believed him and even after batman came back he was very isolated at that time yet still interacting with these people Steph and, and Cassandra are best friends, and it just brought this really great family dynamic together. And I wanted to see people play with that. It was, I, I have to say, I was not familiar with this whole Stephanie Brown, Damian Wayne connection. And, and for those of our listeners who have only heard Young Justice or only seen Young Justice, I talked a little bit about these characters in our Robin episode, but Stephanie Brown does make an appearance in season two of Young Justice, and we are I really am so excited. Really <laughs> really hoping that she ends up showing up in season three, which would be fantastic. But to listen to who was it, it was Cat playing wasn't Cat playing Damien? I believe Cat was Damien in that. So I'm sorry, I think we didn't mention that Cat Cool is actually the other co-founder of the One Shot Podcast Network and is one of my game mastering heroes. And she plays Damien and is fantastic. And then one of your other guests was playing Stephanie and their dynamic was so, it, 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 I think it really showed a little glimpse of what you were talking about with this buddy cop kind of dynamic yeah. between the two of them. It was so, it was cute and endearing in a way that I never expected Damien to be when he first showed up on the scene. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring up Flight of the Robins is because I think that listening to Fly of the Robins gives you a good, uh, I think, a good glimpse into what you can do with role playing games, and is is a fantastic story, but can also give you some interesting dynamics and backgrounds that may inform watching a season three if some of these characters show up. I think it, I think it would be really good for for people across the board. But you clearly know your Batgirl Robin histories, man. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Of the characters at DC, the Bat family, I think, is one of the things that is most important to me. DC is really the comic book company that is invested in legacy heroes. And no, nowhere is that more clear than in the Bat family. And it's just such this beautiful, sprawling franchise full of these great, bright personalities. I, I wanted to play around in that world. Like, I'm actually still sort of planning a follow-up to Flight of the Robins that's set in the Batman Beyond universe where <sighs> we can have an adult Damian Wayne and Terry and Carrie Kelly, like, in the mix together. Oh, man. I want to see how those guys interact. But at the time, like I, I chose Shadowrun simply because it was the role playing system that literally had all of Batman's gadgets in it. Oh, OK. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that is the only reason that I went with Shadowrun is like at the time when I was designing it. I did not know that many role-playing games. Like I was very good with 3.5 and I knew a little feng shui and I knew a lot of Shadowrun. So it's like, well, Shadowrun has just all of the gear. So this is this is all I need to do it. In the time that I have played it since, I have found that, well, Shadowrun is a system that uh, has a special place in my heart. It is not good for doing the story that I wanted to tell. I think I need to do a new approach to this game, probably in an apocalypse 
Apocalypse World or a Fate redo. But also because I'm using iconic characters, like it's not something that I can really sell. So it's a question of whether I want to invest too much of my time and effort into developing more. Though if DC wants somebody to create uh, adventures <laughs> for their iconic uh, superhero RPG, I'm available. Yeah. Hashtag hireable. I have to tell you, I don't know that much about, sh- I know a lot about Shadowrun in general, but I never played fourth. So when I listened to it, I thought the system wasn't great. It was very echoey of the 90s, you know, early mm-hmm. 90s development, but with handfuls of D6s. But having said that, it actually, I felt like the combats and the interactive stuff actually came across pretty well. I was just so surprised that you did. My gut instinct would be like, oh, well, I'm going to run Champions or Mutants and Masterminds or something that's designed as a superhero. And you and you did it in a different way. And Shadowrun has that kind of street level dirty street levelness to it that I thought was a really innovative take actually yeah well I mean that's where I see the bat family like when when you think about Shadowrun you are especially Shadowrun fourth more so than the other Shadowrun editions because I'd say Shadowrun's editions one through three and even a little bit fifth they're a lot more of you can die and this is designed to be lethal and it's like a dungeon crawl just in the cyberpunk future right Shadowrun fourth edition uh, was taking a lot of cues from 3.5. D and D and D three point five Dungeons and Dragons three point five, yeah, and it had this massively unstable, unbalanced, broken system at the core of it, which is kind of beautiful because it lets you do whatever you want with characters. And even if you're playing someone who's just a superhero, you you can make that really easily so i i looked at Shadowrun and as like if i'm building regular people for them to fight yeah and i build these characters like they are batman characters on the other side of it it's going to play out like batman in a really technical and tactical version of batman where right the kids have to come together and they have to coordinate on how they're going to bust up this building this abandoned building full of criminals because getting shot is nothing to sneeze at even with all their bat gear like it's a scary scary thing however if they're stealthy and if they're careful about how they do it they're going to be able to behave just like the bat family should yeah i agree and i really think that it came across and honestly I think I've always wanted the story you wrote. It is really a bit, I, not to oversell it, I'm sorry, I, I get very excited <laughs> about the things I love, as you may recognize, but this story involves these characters in such a way and as a reflection of each other, as opposed to just in their relationship to Batman. So it's just like Young Justice and Teen Titans and the X-Men for that matter in why I love these titles is because it's about being a family and about their different interactions with each other and their different histories and how that affects themselves but in, in relation to each other. And I think that came across really well in the thing that you wrote and how you presented it. It was great. People definitely check it out. We have, we'll have it in the show notes. There are some other things that you've done too even though you haven't done much in the superhero kind of genre. But one of the things I go back and listen to all the time is your Pulp Cthulhu recording. Oh, yes. And we'll definitely be bringing that back at some point, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. And the Pulp Cthulhu scene reflects back on kind of what we were talking about, about taking Batman and stick him in the 1940s, right? As long as you have the heart of the character, you can put him in the 1940s because he was created in the 1940s. Yeah. But this uh, Pulp Cthulhu takes... I'm sorry, it just cracks me up. It's <laughs> Batman, 007, The Doctor, Lord Voldemort, and Indiana Jones walk into a bar, basically. Yeah. It's you have mashed DC, Marvel, and every other pulp thing I can think of. I mean, freaking Doc Savage is in the background of this thing, and Voldemort mind controls Luther at one point, and it's, I, I don't even know how to wrap my head around it. It is hilarious and so kind of honoring of these characters because everybody playing their character loved, clearly loved that character so much. Cat loves Indiana Jones and it comes across, right? Johnny loves Voldemort and they have that kind of detail. It's fantastic and I highly recommend going and checking that one out as well, being a Bat fan, just because just listening to Bruce Wayne and James Bond <laughs> spar back and forth verbally yes. is hilarious. Them flirting over Catwoman. Oh my God. So funny. 
the the pulp cthulhu universe it's like one of those things that i would absolutely love to write but there's no way licensing would ever allow it oh yeah nightmare of licensing it's based on an idea that Kat had when we were in college. She put together a changeling game based on characters from, I, I think it's Victorian era literature. Oh, interesting. Kind of like a, what's that called? League of Extraordinary Gentlemen kind of reflection. Very League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It was a Captain Ahab, Artful Dodger, Alice, Ooh. and like a, a couple others going after Jack the Ripper. Oh, very cool. It was just a great investigation game that she put together and actually never got to run. One of the things that I want her to do is put that game together again so that we can finally make it (laughs) reach the air so that it finally gets played. But it was such a great idea that I was like, okay, you took characters created in a certain time period or that existed in a certain time period and you put them together. I want to do that with another decade. So I, I looked at the 40s because you know i love world war ii era fiction nothing nothing i like more than fighting nazis yeah (laughs) and you know i looked around i was like let's start with batman because he's so cool who else is operating at that time well you've got indiana jones who who fought the nazis and in a fan theory that kat and i developed together indiana jones and voldemort must have known each other because Voldemort had this period during the 40s where he was going all over the world looking for different artifacts to make horcruxes out of. Is that canon? That's canon. Really? Oh, I thought you guys were just tweaking timelines like with James Bond. No, no. Voldemort is like really old and before he rose to power, like during the 40s and and 50s, he was like cruising around the world making horcruxes. Um, And I just... like we just thought how great would it be if these two kept running into each other and you've got this muggle who time and time again is outwitting and outmaneuvering Voldemort driving him nuts (laughs) because like you know it's a young Tom Riddle who's like in his 20s and 30s up against Indiana Jones who is like more seasoned in his mid 40s and it's perfect so that relationship dynamic really appealed to us and you know I love pulp fiction so much i love doc savage and it's just dc had a imprint for a while where batman doc savage and i think the spirit were working together yeah I, that came out briefly in the late 2000s like just around 2010 maybe and it was super fun but it was also like not my ideal version of the characters because batman was using guns right very 40s the original batman yeah yeah like late 20s batman or late 30s batman rather so i like i put these characters in a bottle and i think the original story was a racial ghoul story mm-hmm. more so than oh god who did the ultimate villain i I'm, i don't think we should spoil anything because i'm literally sending people over there <laughs> but what i do want to say like we kind of went on an aside here but there was a method to my madness and this is a reflection of what happens when you take creative people like greg and brandon and the team that works on young justice and they dive deeper into the characters and look at how different things affect each other. This whole thing you're talking about with Voldemort and Indiana Jones, if they lived in the same universe, how would each person's existence affect the other? The idea that Dr. Fate exists in Young Justice, diving deeper, deeper to find out how does the Helmet of Fate, you know, to look at, I I know they sat down and said, does the Helmet of Fate affect Superboy? Is it important to the storyline that this happens? Okay, well, what about Zatanna and Zatara? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, the first thing off the cliche shelf is, of course, it's going to affect them. But how do we make this so much deeper for these characters? How do we move plot and character development forward by diving in? And what you did in, even though it is comedy gold, pulp Cthulhu, (laughs) I don't want to make any, Lucille Ball shows up at one point, like... (laughs) I don't want anyone to walk into that episode not being well aware that it is it is full of fun and comedy, but you can also tell, just like with Flight of the Robins, that both the players and the GM, that would be James, Game Master, really cares and loves these characters and puts that passion on the screen. You know what I mean? Or in this case, in your ears, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you're a writer or you're a creator and you want to do more than just consume the material that we're watching... 
and you want to know how to create this material for yourself, I think understanding that level of passion can translate in a way that you don't understand or can't necessarily quantify is a very important aspect of the creative process. I think what it stems from is the creative work starting from a place of admiration, love, and respect. And it is easy to tell when you see a new take on a character that does not come from that place versus when it does. I can see like the Brave and the Bold cartoon oh, uh, yeah. has the best Aquaman in the world. It's just the best Aquaman has ever been. I may argue with that, but I won't argue with the fact that Brave and the Bold was so much better than it ever deserved to be. There is so <laughs> much love in that show. I can't believe how much I love that show. So me looking at that Aquaman, I can go, okay, they're not treating Aquaman with respect, but they are treating him with a deep love yeah you know absolutely in that show more so than any comic that i've ever read aquaman is the king yeah and he enjoys being a king and being a superhero and you see time and time and again in that series is he has a real confidence and love even though he is the superhero on the justice league that talks to fish he loves that he is the superhero that talks to fish and right. he owns that and you look at something like jeff john's new 52 run on aquaman and it's clearly coming from a place of aquaman's not a cool character but i'm gonna prove to you that he is and i am one of the people that i know that does <laughs> not appreciate that depiction of aquaman because it to me, it just so much of it rings hollow because it feels like Jeff Johns was working very hard to convince you that he, the author, could make Aquaman cool, who is a character that is not cool, versus you looking at Brave and the Bold going, these are kind of cool aspects of Aquaman's personality is that he's a king and a superhero. What if we just cranked those up to 10? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. The idea of the approach of where you're starting from. Right. So to start from a place where, OK, you clearly believe that Aquaman isn't cool, but I'm going to do things to make him cool mm -hmm. is different from starting from a place of saying, oh, Aquaman doesn't need to be fixed. He just needs to be shown. Yeah. Right. And Mark Wade, one of the one of my favorite comic writers of all time, had this great little thing he wrote about when he his Fantastic Four run where he was like, the thing doesn't need big spikes on his armor and to join a superhero world wrestling federation. These characters don't need to be fixed. <laughs> they don't need to have weird things happen to them. You need to understand who they are. And at the core of who they are is not superheroes. They're explorers who happen to live in a world full of superheroes and have superpowers. But they're much more like Indiana Jones, Challengers of the Unknown, you know, kind of characters. And if you start there and let them be that and expand out into the superhero world, then you get what's unique about the Fantastic Four, right? Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of it doesn't come from statements of going, this character is not this. It's going, this character is this or possesses this quality. One of my favorite things that DC does is the Elseworlds imprint. Oh, yeah. For sure. And I think it's I think it's been a couple of years since they've put out an Elseworlds book, but Elseworlds essentializes my theory of superheroes as the modern myth Absolutely. pretty beautifully. Yes. You and where me they both. just yeah. they take these aspects of these characters and they just put them in different contexts and see what happens. Yeah. And like the best Elseworlds series start with a, a real love of elements that make that character and sometimes it is just picking on one of those elements and exploring it sometimes it's taking all of them and just putting them in a new context it's a really cool experiment and i do think the best superhero stories come from somebody who's got a clear love and passion and just wants to see what happens if you do something slightly different yeah a, a marvel example i don't know why i keep bringing it up i'm the one who keeps bringing up marvel here but um, <laughs> is uh, what was it called? Sixteen oh nine, something like that. Oh yeah, that was yeah, where the they Spider Man. Were, oh, man, that was uh, really. I think it was seventeen oh six. Something like that. maybe they had a couple series. I don't remember, but it was really interesting to take these concepts and ideas of heroes and put putting them in a completely different time era and having them relate to each other. 
really amazing stuff. Anyway, I think we've made that point pretty clear, I think. <laughs> but uh, as we start wrapping up the show here, I wanted to ask you, when did you hear about Young Justice Season 3's announcement? Do you remember where you were? The answer to that is I heard about it on Facebook 10,000 times before it was real. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, Thank you so much. Just playing with my goddamn heart. And like every time that it would happen, like I I celebrated, I think the first two times. And then after that, I was just like, okay, you need to always double check to see if it's real. (laughs) And then finally, finally, like there was that big news break a while back that like Netflix was considering it and like, if you talked to Netflix customer service, they'd go, ah, there have been discussions. And it felt like, oh man, this could really happen. And the keep binging Young Justice hashtag like floating around, it felt like we could really push for this. And for me, it felt like there was a momentum of a couple months where every couple weeks there would be a new article. Uh, There was constant attention on social media, a huge push by the fans. I was running Netflix on my uh, (laughs) Wii U while I was doing other things on my PS4, just trying to get that count up. And then it felt like all that disappeared. Yeah. And I just sort of gave up on it. I was like, okay, well, you know, we gave it our all. Like we, we really, really did. pushed for this. Yeah. We showed that we love this thing. And it's like, you can't win every battle and you just got to hope that the next series is going to be as good. And then you know, the news came out. Like I saw it on Facebook and I immediately went to check on the internet. Is this real? Is this another fake out? And it wasn't. And like, you were actually one of the first people that I thought of is like, oh my God, I feel like Rich did it. I feel like he's, he started his podcast. He started up whelmed. He's getting all these great guests on. Like it's, it's finally happening. And now I'm just sitting, waiting to see what they're going to do with it. And I don't, I don't expect season three to be perfect. Right. Because, you know, season one, they had to find their feet. And season two, that show was headed on such an incredible trajectory. I am fully confident that they are going to be able to get that back, but it might it might take some time to spool up. So I am excited to see what will happen in season three. And I hope that season three is followed by a four and a five where the show keeps getting better and better. Yeah, I am a big believer in not having a show go longer than it needs to go. And I'm mm-hmm. okay if season three, believe it or not, I'd be okay if season three was the end of the story and that's okay. Because uh, see, Rich, I will push back against that <laughs> because this is a superhero story. And the one thing about superhero stories is ends. they have to keep going. Yes, that's fair. But I do know, no, quote unquote, that um, Greg Weissman, he has been so good in the last five years of not spoiling so many things that he has already planned in a 250 plus page series Bible that I don't even know how far he got into. He may have five seasons planned. I don't know. What I do know is that the stuff that we were seeing at the very season finale of season two were being planted in the first few episodes of season one. So everything in the background that's happening in the show is so tightly woven. I'm hoping it doesn't take them too long to find their feet. I don't expect necessarily they will take time as much as other shows do but you're not wrong like a five-year hiatus when you had such inertia going might take them a while behind the scenes to kind of get warmed up again yeah Uh, young justice has earned my patience (laughs) yeah there there are so many aspects of that show i was like uh robin's obsession with words is like a weird annoying character trait uh superboy is just a big ball of rage with no character depth Ugh. miss martian is a weird cartoon of a human being and it all paid off man <laughs> it all every paid single off. one of those things <laughs> paid off so they can take their time <laughs> i am a hundred percent on board with you sir all right so thank you james so much for coming on man we have been trying to get together just to chat for a really long time and i am so glad this was it well i hope that's not all, At least for all now. For now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks so much for spending time with us in the cave. Where can people find you out and about on Earth Prime? 
Well, if you would like to get in contact with me, the best place is through Twitter. I'm at OneShotRPG. And if you want to hear some of my work, including Flight of the Robins and the Pope Cthulhu games, you can find that at OneShotPodcast.com. We don't have a great way of searching for specific episodes in our current site setup. We are working on that. But I usually recommend people to just Google One Shot Podcast and the name of the episode. So one shot podcast flight of the robins one shot podcast pulp cthulhu i'm gonna actually um cut all those steps out for you because i've already done all that research for you they will be in the show notes for all the episodes so don't you worry your pretty little robin about it perfect and and, and i will plug an upcoming episode uh in january i am going to be doing masks i have already recorded this series and i recorded it with some really fantastic people uh molly ostertag from the webcomic yep. strong female protagonist noel stevenson from lumberjanes and nimona so there is some fantastic comics talent that is in that episode and if you like young justice if you like teen superhero stories that team really knocked it out of the park so if you if you listen to a series be sure to tune in january for that one i literally can't wait for this <laughs> <laughs> thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us you can find us on twitter at the yj files on facebook at www.facebook.com crashing the mode and on our website www.crashingthemode.com if you enjoy improv shows or radio dramas and are at all curious about what Caleb and I keep talking about when we're talking about gaming and you made it through this episode not knowing, <laughs> please do yourself a favor and check out Flight of the Robins, Pulp Cthulhu, and The Legend of the Five Ring series. They are incredible pieces of storytelling. In fact, you can hear Caleb himself, my favorite co-host, in the Legend of the Five Ring sessions that are both on One Shot and the Part 2, which was mind-blowing on the RPG Academy network. Do not miss them. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can find us at Whelms the Young Justice Files on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. And consider leaving us a five-star rating. The ratings help others to find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And even though season three has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix. Pick up the comics. Get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. Mm -hmm. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. <laughs>